One of the earliest memories that I have is waking up in my crib in the morning. This is just coming to me. So waking up in my, my, my little crib, I slept, it was next to a window. And I, when I went to sleep, there were the, the stars and there were the, the, the trees, you know, out my window. I heard this sound. And it was a sound I'd never heard before. And it was a singing kind of ringing and it just kept going it never stopped and it just I was kind of hypnotized I was immobilized by this sound and I couldn't find the source I looked out there I saw the clothesline there's nothing there I looked around I couldn't find the source of the sound and it haunted me for years what was that sound until I started working with Thomas Aber who's a musician I play with and he was playing the gaida, which is the Bulgarian bagpipes. It's a, a whole goat that's been gutted. We started working together and when I heard that sound of the bagpipes, I had, that memory came back that I'd forgotten of when I was a kid. I goes, that was it. That was what I heard when I was four years old or however old I was, waking up in the morning. It was the sound of the bagpipes singing out and ringing. I don't know if that explains anything about my music, but there is this kind of recurrence, this reaching into some kind of archetypal space. Here you're seeing the oceans of Kansas. You'll see the waves washing in, but you'll also see this rock in the center. You see that? There's something strange about that rock. It's actually a crinoid. It's a crinoid that's from Missouri. It's a crinoid that was from, really, the oceans of Kansas that were here. And it's a piece, it's a meditation in deep time. The music comes from a piece of chalk that I went out to western Kansas and I collected this piece of chalk that was from this period of time. What happened was when it was an uh, ocean, the, glo the globigerina, which were these, these plankton that was in the ocean, they died and settled on the bottom of the ocean floor. And then I brought it back to the studio right here. It was right here where I'm sitting right now. And I put it in a bowl of water, a piece of this chalk. I put a, a microphone, one of our very nice condenser microphones, on top of the chalk. Then I shut the studio up, turned the recording on. That's when I dropped it after I recorded it on. Then I went and did yoga for about a half hour. <laughs> and then I came back and I listened to the recording. It is amazing. You can hear it now. You hear, you hear these little voices, these little crackling and popping, these little kind of, those are the voices of the plankton, of the globigerina, of these, these tiny little creatures uh, that were fossilized. Then that chalk, the fossilized chalk dropped back into water. They are telling their stories the 76 million year old story of who they are and where they came from. You are watching now and listening to The Tree of Life, which was part of the Darwin opera that I created with Michael Henry. The Tree of Life is generated sound or generated music, music that is generated from the Tree of Life chart. The Tree of Life chart shows uh, living species as they move up in time and then diverge. When there's a divergence of species, we see a branching form. And if you trace these out, as Darwin did, it creates these branching forms that look like a tree. So Michael Henry and I, we plotted 
that chart, the one that Darwin made, we plotted directly to the instruments. They were playing verbatim uh, those lines and all the different lines are kind of orchestrated. So the Tree of Life, when you came into the opera, you were hearing it for the first half hour before the opera started. And then in the opera, you'll see we had all of the, we had all the characters in Darwin's life, Darwin, uh, Charles Darwin, Emma Darwin, his wife, who's transformed into the Worm Queen. Uh, you have Thomas Huxley, who was his defender and bulldog and scientist in England. So uh, Darwin is one of those people that is a figure, a flashpoint for a number of forces that come through, like a lot of the people that I deal with. Someone who, you know, raised a lot of questions about who we are, about our place in the world, to readdress those questions, to start to look at things contextually and in relation to each other, to get out of this more egotistical way of looking and thinking that our lives and who we are ends at our skins. We start to understand that who we are is much greater than that. critical culture here at the Kansas City Art Institute is one of the most important and distinguishing aspects of the Art Institute. But it is not the only way to teach. It is not the only way to make art. It is not the only way to improve our craft and to open our minds and fulfill our potentials. And so with Grupo, with the ensemble that I work with. It's student-led. It's all students. I'm the faculty sponsor. But we don't have any big critiques at all. We do it all by doing. So I had three students want to do directed studies around sound, and I said, I can't do it. I don't have the time, but here's the deal. I have a one-hour office hour every week so during my office hour, we can play, we can make music, we can uh, improvise with sound. My main method, I would say, I have different things I do, but my main belief is in anamnesis. Anamnesis is a Greek term for waking up to what you already know waking up to the life you are living. You have all the answers. You know everything, but you just haven't realized it.